Good morning to everyone. I'm Joanne Carling, a Kankanai from the Cordillera Philippines, and I work with the Asia. In, uh, I'm sorry, I work with the Indigenous Peoples Major Group on Sustainable Development. I, I slipped in mentioning my old organization, <laughs> which I worked for eight years with. Anyway, this session, as, as mentioned here in the, in the program, is the power and pitfalls of local communities, a dialogue between global indigenous leaders. This is actually a, more a session on uh, issues relating to land, territories, and resources of indigenous peoples in relation to management, challenges, threats, but also the other values of, of lands and resources for indigenous peoples for sustainable landscape management. We actually have six speakers, a very well ba gender balanced set of speakers. As you can see, another woman is coming up, so don't worry, there will be three women and, and three men. It's a, it's a very uh, global set of, of, of uh, speakers that we have here. We have all the way from New Zealand uh, to uh, the US, from Uganda in, in Africa, Chile and Latin America. And we're also privileged to have strong advocates on indigenous people's rights joining us in the panel from Italy and also from C4. So um, since we're a bit uh, running out uh, of, of time, I would just like to first introduce our speakers to you so that you know who are in, oh, the, the people uh, in, in front of you. So first we have uh, Rochelle Diver. Can you please stand up? Uh, she is from uh, Ojibwe from the Great Lakes region in Minnesota, US. She is an independent consultant working in areas of environment, health and toxics and the rights of indigenous peoples with special em emphasis on indigenous women. Uh, we also have Celia. Celia Wetehera is a Maori woman from the Te Rarawana and Ngapuyi uh, tribes of Northern Aotearoa, New Zealand. She is a representative, representative of the Te Kap Kapu Pacific Indigenous and Local Knowledge Center of Distinction. Over the last decade, she has worked with numerous indigenous communities in New Zealand, providing pathways to empower them to actively participate in the management of their resources using local indigenous knowledge systems. Thank you. Now we have Christian Serna. He is an Aymara from Chile. He is a social anthropologist, uh, taking up his PhD now. He studies social policies for priority groups and indigenous peoples and evaluate, like, evol evaluate public policies. He has worked with indigenous Aymara and Quechua communities in the north of Chile. He has contributed to the understanding, recognition, and safeguarding of biocultural heritage of the Andean region and informal economic systems that define the relationships between indigenous peoples, the state, and society as a whole. Okay, then we have uh, Nathan. Nathan Makureje, he is the coordinator of the Civil Society Coalition of Indigenous Peoples in Uganda. He is a Batwa and working on landscape restorations and Red Plus in relation to, to forest. And now we have our two uh, um, experts here, if I may say, and, and strong advocates. First, we have uh, Luca Migiano. Uh, he is the, wait, you made some correction in your, <laughs> he's the deputy manager of the Grow, Grow campaign under Oxfam Novib, which is the international, uh, the Dutch branch of the international NGO. He is responsible for influencing work on climate change, land rights, and agriculture. He's currently the Oxfam representative in the land rights campaign now. Before joining Oxfam, Luca was advisor of the Secretariat of the International Land Coalition, where he established a program to protect land and environmental defenders at risks. And 
last but not the least, we're very, uh, very privileged to have a scientist with us, Anne Larson. She's the principal scientist at C4. She's the team leader for equity, gender, and tenure. She worked mainly on forest, governance, indigenous peoples, and gender. Now, uh, the, the way we will proceed with this, uh, with this uh, session is I'm, I'm going to ask our panelists a, a question and they will expound after that because we have six. We will immediately open the floor for questions and comments from, uh, from you, from the participants. And then uh, we will wrap up with uh, their concluding remarks. We hope we will have uh, time to interact with you in this special um, session. This is the only uh, session where it's de dedicated on, on indigenous peoples, but also to related issues that indigenous peoples are, are facing in relation to landscapes. So the, I would like to first uh, throw the question to Rochelle. Um, so Rochelle, as you know, with your long experience and even centuries of uh, experience in uh, water management in the Great Lakes in, in Minnesota, what are the challenges that you are facing now to sustain your sustainable practices of water landscape management? Thank you, Joan, and good morning to everyone. Buju Anin, I greet you in my language. Um, I'm so happy to be here today and to be able to talk to you about the traditional homelands that I come from and the severe threats that we're under. Um, we uh, are faced with a number of uh, different uh, threats that are uh, set to contaminate our water, our lands, and our natural resources. Um, Minnesota is the, the land of 10,000 lakes. Uh, it's some of the most uh, beautiful, untouched land uh, in all of the United States uh, in our northern corner of the Boundary Waters. Our, our land and waters are in serious danger of becoming contaminated uh, to, to the point where it's beyond repair. Um, so this is, is an urgent call that I'm bringing to you today. Uh, I'll focus on three major areas that are uh, the threats that we're facing currently. Um, first is the Enbridge Pipeline. Uh, this is a pipeline that originates in Alberta, Canada and carries the dirty and highly controversial uh, tar sands oil. The pipeline has run through uh, Minnesota and right under my nation of Fond du Lac uh, since the early 50s. Uh, so this, this pipeline is old, it's aging, and it's corroding. Um, right now they have a project that's called the Enbridge Line 3 Extension. Uh, so they're looking not only to repair the current lines, uh, they're also trying to add additional lines, uh, which uh, is, is a very uh, scary thing for all of us when uh, we have to consider that these, land, uh, these pipelines run uh, right through uh, our waterways uh, and right through our uh, traditional uh, wild rice beds, our traditional food. So um, it's, it's important also to point out that we're right on the tip of Lake Superior. Uh, Lake Superior is one of the five Great Lakes uh, in the United States and it is one of the, um, it is the largest freshwater lake by surface uh, and it's the third largest freshwater lake by volume in the world. Uh, and they have a pipeline running right alongside of it. So um, that's uh, extremely scary for all of us here. Um, the second is uh, iron ore mining and coal-fired power plants that we find in northern Minnesota. Um, th these uh, are just north of my nation, so the contamination and the runoff uh, comes right into, once again, our waterways and to our lands. Um, the coal-fired power plants and um, iron ore mining uh, are causing uh, our wild rice to be suffocated by sulfates. It's putting mercury in our water, mercury in the fish, uh, which is then putting mercury in our people, uh, in our women, and, and providing er, and posing severe threats um, to our indigenous women and to our future generations. Um, and finally, um, and this is uh, the most severe, and this is where my call to action uh, comes, for all of you, comes to all of you, um, it's uh, the Boundary Waters area in northern Minnesota, near the border of Canada. Uh, this water has, uh, this area has been protected. Uh, some very strong protections were given under the Obama administration. Um, this is the land where 
um, not only people from Minnesota and Canada go, um, but people travel from all across the United States to be able to access um, these wonderful lands, to canoe the waters, um, to camp, and to really uh, become one with nature there. And uh, unfortunately, uh, recently, uh, the Trump administration has uh, canceled uh, the protections that were provided previously uh, and is opening this up to uh, mining practices um, that what happened in December of 2017. So we're still at the beginning processes of trying to obtain permits. So we're still at the point where hopefully we can stop this. Um, the, uh, the mining will be uh, sulfide ore mining used to extract copper and nickel. And um, it would use acid, arsenic, mercury, and lead in this process. Um, none of this belongs anywhere near, um, anywhere that we uh, are using the lands or waters to provide our traditional food sources. So as Native people and traditional subsistence livers, we are disproportionately impacted um, by these mining practices. Um, so, and I'll, I'll make a, a bigger call out to you um, in my final words here. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to the next panelist. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Rochelle. The, I mean, the, 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 her case exemplifi exemplifies also the challenge of, uh, cro of cross-border water systems in terms of uh, management and protection. How do we actually, from a landscape perspective, manage such resources when it's, it's between two, when, when the, the activities in one country affects the water bodies in another, in another country? Uh, now I would like to uh, move on to Celia. Uh, based on your, because as, 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 as mentioned um, er, earlier, uh, Celia is, is uh, working with the Indigenous uh, Knowledge Distinction Center. So with, with your work with many of the Indigenous uh, communities in, in New Zealand, can you tell us more on the on the cultural indicators and land indicators that you are using, because from indigenous perspectives, land and resources are not just material uh, matters, but they are very much intrinsic to our culture. So it's good to hear from Celia on what kind of uh, cultural indicators are, are they using. Kia ora koutou katoa, ngā mahi nui kia koutou. Um, I'm just saying hello and greetings to you all um, in my native language, um, Māori from New Zealand. Um, some of the issues that we have in New Zealand related to um, environmental management, because the Pacific is um, made up of over 30,000 islands um, and we are an oceanic people, um, our ecosystem in New Zealand is extremely fragile. And this fragileness of our ecosystem makes it susceptible to um, invasive pest animals and weeds and also um, to pathogens that, that can kill our native forests and um, to invasive water species and marine species that can um, take over our natural habitat of our um, natural species. And our endemic, we have a lot of endemic species in New Zealand, both fauna and flora, and these are extremely susceptible to diseases and um, invasive species. So as an indigenous people, we have unique ways of um, perceiving our natural environment. In Aotearoa, our Māori worldview is one where our relationship to the land, the ocean and the resources within it are based on whakapapa, genealogy. We have a Māori proverb in New Zealand, ko te au te whenua, ko te whenua te au. I am the land, the land is me. And with that, sort of gives you a sense of, of how we see ourselves in terms of the environment. We are not an owner of the environment, we are part of a whole. In Australia, the Aboriginal peoples and the Terry, Nation peop uh, Terry Island peoples um, have lived on that land for over 60,000 years. And to them, when you walk on their land, you're walking on their ancestors, literally. So that's the relationship that we have with our land. And with that relationship comes responsibility to protect, restore and enhance the life force and the essence of our natural environment. We are the voice. When governing agencies come to talk to us about resource management, 
We start by talking about us as a people, about our culture and our health and our well-being. Then, if we decide we trust them, we might start talking about our resources. It's through our traditional ecological knowledge and our cultural practices based on generations of observation of our natural environment that we have our own cultural monitoring and assessment techniques. These techniques have been adapted over generations and over time to suit today's environment, respecting our traditional knowledge. And this is our language of science, which we have created for us, by us. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, there has been a resurgence in Māori practising the use of traditional ecological knowledge and creating cultural indicators to assess the state of our environment. Um, some of these key projects that we're working on that we have brought back and are using um, can deal with things like Cody Dieback, which is a program um, that uses cultural health indicators to surveil um, as a surveillance and monitoring tool um, to take care of a pathogen that is killing our native forests in New Zealand. And this program is also looking at traditional not, um, medicines as a potential cure to these types of pathogens. And this is being piloted in three um, indigenous communities where the, this pathogen is destroying our forest. Another area that we're a project that I'm working on is the Nor Northern Wairua Freshwater Program, where we're developing um, a, a program to manage uh, the whole catchment, which is one of the largest catchments in the northern region of New Zealand, um, that has the highest sedimentation and is polluting one of our largest um, harbours um, in Australasia, um, with and creating. Um, Habitats where we can no longer collect our um, traditional, use our traditional, cust um, our customary resources to sustain ourselves as a people. And this program is looking at it from a cultural way of understanding our environment and reconnecting ourselves as a people and looking at what values we have in this catchment and working together with all the communities along that catchment to um, clean up the health and wellbeing of that catchment. Some of the issues related to doing this is the fact that in New Zealand we were colonised and this has meant that we've had alienate, um, been alienated from our lands and um, stopped from using our, um, our traditional practices of um, resource harvesting and things like that, which has really impacted on our ability to be us, um, our, us as a people because when you get alienation from your land, you lose the ability to... Um, connect yourself to that land. And so through part of our work, my work through using cultural health indicators and traditional knowledge is also reconnecting our people back to the land and giving them a sense of identity. Thank you. So that's, that's a case where traditional uh, knowledge is, is being used to manage fragile ecosystems. Uh, and especially in the context of land alienation, where it becomes a tool for, for people to reclaim your, their identity and land and, and resource management systems. Now we move to, uh, to Chile. Uh, so, uh, Christian, you've been uh, working a lot on, on biocultural heritage. So, with your work, can you tell us more on the interlinkages of indigenous peoples' rights and sustainable development, uh, focusing on, on resource management. Yes. Um, um, first of all, sorry for my English. Uh, I read a lot. Uh, in the Andes, uh, assume it's common in a scenario of pressure, uh, this uh, structure and negative impacts of the relation uh, to the general society and the state, establishing uh, minimums or margins uh, from non-dominant position for for the indigenous, yes, uh, which are uh, reproduction in context of invisibility, um, assimilation, as, assimilate, assimilation, assimilation, assimilation uh, positions, yes. But uh, the indigenous have uh, 
local knowledge associated uh, with, uh, with the biogeographical um, context, yes. And in this, in this from in the northern Chile, we work about uh, the uh, reports, yes, and um, um, uh, of the um, territories and the customaries, yes, relate to the the the, um, the social organization, yes, and and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We'll have a translation so that uh, yeah. <laughs> Christian can feel more comfortable speaking. Okay. So Eileen will translate. Bueno, voy a hablar en español. Es más cómodo para mí. <laughs> eh, bien, eh, de manera que hemos podido trabajar en relación a, a la participación comunitaria, también al reconocimiento de, de nosotros como, yo soy antropólogo de base, eh, como antropólogos también parte de la comunidad y del territorio andino, entonces hemos podido generar dos procesos bien interesantes. Uno Espérame. de <laughs> as part of the work, they have been working in the participation of the of the local communities. His anthropology, so they have been doing two different processes. Eh, asociados a primero. Eh, ponerse en la perspectiva de, de la, del territorio y pensar el territorio como un lugar de hábitat. Eh, uh, first, thinking about the, terri the, the territorial space as the space of living. Y luego como un espacio colectivo en el cual se han desarrollado un conjunto de experiencias sinérgicas con, el, eh, con las organizaciones, digamos, en el contexto de ancestralidad. And the other is thinking in the, the territory as a collective space where they had been um, taking activities related to this um, traditional knowledge. Pero aquí tenemos una cuestión que, que de algún modo eh, ha sido, bueno, esto es un discurso clasi, casi clásico de la antropología, lo que he dicho hasta este minuto. <laughs> eh, pero This is a, a classic anthropology discourse. Yes. Pero el avance es justamente cómo generamos desarrollo, cómo generamos. The, the idea is how we going to develop, uh, how to we going to generate development for indigenous people. Eh, relacionado, verdad, a que estamos en un en un contexto que de alguna manera eh, demanda una reflexividad sobre la base de la idea de desarrollo. In a context that we have to think about the uh, context of develop the idea of development. Y luego también del modelo socialdemócrata. And the uh, social demo democratic model. Que conecta mercado, sociedad y Estado. That link market, society and state. Esto lo mencionamos así porque básicamente es fundamental para las comunidades no solamente poner en valor los recursos en términos, digamos, lo vemos económicamente, recursos. This is important because the the community is it also important for the community community thinking in uh, put a value value in ¿qué dijiste? Eh, poner digamos la, los recursos verdad poner en valor los recursos uh, have a value of the natural resources sino que justamente generar en el territorio de territorio deprimido verdad despoblado en términos de la de los indicadores ahí tengo algunas cosas Yeah. And generate um, this uh, this um, reflection in these territories that are really uh, the private territories. Generar eh, procesos económicos, sociales y de participación incidente respecto. Thinking and about generate these um, social and economic activities in relation to de los gobiernos locales y por otro lado de la economía, ¿verdad? Yeah. General economic activities to this uh, local government. Sí. Sí. Eh, en, ese, en ese sentido, 
hemos eh, puesto en valor, digamos, en términos comunitarios, desde, desde la consideración de diferentes zonas, altiplano y precordillera o sierra, ¿verdad? We have been thinking the different ecosystem eh, areas. Eh, tanto las dimensiones eh, que generan la condición de sujeto colectivo, ¿verdad? Pueblo. Those, that, this, this idea of what is generate this collective um, aspect in the communities. Eh, y luego, el siguiente. siguiente, el el siguiente. siguiente. Eh, y luego los territorios como lugar de innovación, ¿verdad? And the indigenous territory as a place of innovation. Lugar de innovación y lugar, y lugar de experiencia colectiva. And Don, place of collective act, eh, experience. Donde en realidad nosotros culturalmente y desde Occidente vemos la innovación desde la tecnología o desde alguna situación eh, externa a los pueblos. Y la verdad, tenemos mucho que aprender de la relación entre cultura y naturaleza que ocurre en los Andes. Normally, from the outside, we saw all this innovation about technology, but we have to think about this relation between um, culture and natural resources in our territories, in the Andean area. Yeah, y con esto voy concluyendo para no restarle tiempo a la otra. Eh, básicamente, entonces, parte de una experiencia, como había mencionado, de carácter eh, antropológica participativa con las personas y en base también a reconocernos, This is the basis of this experience about an anthropology um, uh, reflection and in the basis of reconnection. reconnection. Pero luego, entonces, tenemos que plantearnos desde el desarrollo y cómo se genera entonces la mitigación de variables que tienen que ver con la precarización de las condiciones de los territorios ancestrales. Y We, por, uh -huh. We have to think about development and how to mitigate all these uh, um, some aspect about the the deprivation of the indigenous territories. Y por otro lado, generar un aprendizaje tanto a nivel comunitario, institucional, and, el, yeah, yeah. Uh, and generate a learning in the community and in the institutions respecto de los de los derechos colectivos in relation to the collective right of indigenous people eso y base, y el tema de, de entender entonces nuestra implementación de derechos colectivos en contexto de de capitalismo and, <laughs> yeah. and understand our collective right in term in this capitalist context y que entonces implica también reconocer al capitalismo como aspect, como una desde su matriz sociocultural que reconoce eh, las condiciones individuales para relacionarse tanto con el Estado y con entre nosotros, entonces. And recognize the capitalism as a matrix of social cultural relationship, but in an individual eh, vision. Muy amables. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, uh, his presentation emphasized on the need to recognize collective rights and ownership and the ter ter a, ter a territorial approach to development, taking into account the social and, and, and cultural dimensions of indigenous peoples. So now we move on to the forest. Uh, so Nathan, um, can you... Can you tell us more on the challenges of indigenous peoples in relation to land restoration in Uganda? Thank you. Uh, my presentation is going to be based on mainly my interaction with the community and experience I have got in the participation of uh, Red Plus project and also landscape restoration project. Uh, first of all, I want to tell everybody that Uganda, before 1990, was half of it was covered by forests. But today, that's 25 to 28 years ago. But today, it has lost more, at least 50% of the forests. And I'm going straight away to 
what is the role of the indigenous people and the challenges they have faced in this during this period. Of course, as I mentioned sometime yesterday, we have everybody in Uganda, of course, is considered indigenous, but there are those groups who are more indigenous than other indigenous people. Those are mainly the Batwa, the Ik, the Tepeth, the Karamajong, and the Benet. These are actually now recognized in Uganda as forest indigenous peoples, or sometimes as minority indigenous peoples. So uh, these people were previously living, were previously living in the forests, but they were pushed out. They were pushed out mainly because the government gazetted these places for tourism and conservation, for investment, but also to the land grabbers. Now, of recent, as recent as 2005 to, to date, the government has started realizing that what they, they have done is not good. So they, have, they are trying to put up policies to make sure that these people participate. Also, of course, the international prayers. We have organizations that have come out, like IUCN, like Oxfam, World Bank, UN. All of those ones, they have come out to say that, look here, they are indigenous peoples. Also, they are indigenous peoples, they are local communities. So you must protect the rights of indigenous peoples. Despite the fact that you have this opportunity of participating in the landscape restoration and also Red Plus and other processes, we have faced four main challenges. The first challenge is participation. We don't participate effectively. Why? One, uh, there is limited capacity on the part of the indigenous peoples. The government has been making policies uh, from national level and also borrowing from international level, trying to catch up with international commitments. But how will the ordinary indigenous person who has never gone to school, who is still relying on in, uh, traditional knowledge, going to read the books, going to read the, uh, to understand the technology which is moving so fast to catch up with these processes. So participation is a challenge. Um, I'm one of the leaders of indigenous peoples and I work for them. I know how these processes are demanding. So when we try to localize them down, we find that we don't easily fit. So participation has been a challenge. And there are other challenges, of course, within our societies, the way we perceive women, the way we perceive youth, and all of that. The other issue, I don't know, I can call it maybe trade and investment and globalization. We are getting, the government is encouraging uh, foreign private investments to accelerate uh, development. We want to catch up, we want infrastructure, we want everything, load schools and all of that. But we must give in our resources because these investors just don't come. So what happened is that they come for our lands and they use modern technology and they pay less attention to restoration. Of recent, we have one of the huge, huge lakes in, in Uganda, it's called Lake Victoria. So the, the Chinese are making sand, grasses from the sand and other materials. They bring very large machinery, collect sand, and uh, try to make grasses, and some of it actually they, they, they say is exported. So now, bringing the ordinary person, the, the, the indigenous person who has been living in the forest, moreover chased forcefully to participate effectively is, is not easy. I know last year, the National Forest Authority called for proposals for all the communities 
to come and participate in landscape restoration, giving out very large expanses of land that had been previously forest to be restored. But what happened is that of those communities, the indigenous peoples never took even a single hectare of land. All the land was allocated to the rich, the business companies for restoration. And what the, these people are doing, they are selling again land to private people for investment. So we have that challenge. Then the other challenge we have is basically, of course, as I have said, uh, failure to balance uh, gender. You have a lot of land. Who, 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 which people are managing this land for restoration? One class, men. Women are out. And to me, most of the work in Africa, especially work to do with tilling land, and also interacting with forests, it's done by women. Then, lastly, we are confused. We don't know how we are going to successfully call out landscape restoration without having a proper plan for sustainable livelihood. Because you talk about restoring land, but again, people have to survive. People have to get income. The indigenous people, 99% of our indigenous people depend on land. So, as long as there are no sustainable livelihood incomes, there are no livelihood sustainable opportunities. The issue of landscape restoration in Uganda becomes a challenge. Then lastly, anyway, I must talk about uh, the, indigenous, the indigenous peoples are uh, being faced with uh, an issue of cross-border movements. Uh, initially, it wasn't a problem, but it is slowly becoming a problem because we are being taught that uh, we must uh, participate in landscape restoration, but there are a lot of cross-border movements. For example, in northern Uganda, there is a group from Kenya called the Turkan. They come, they come to Uganda with their large herds of cattle and goats. Uh, they, they, they go in the community, and remember the community land has been squeezed. Uh, has been grabbed and uh, it is becoming scarce. Then the Batwa from the Democratic Republic of Congo, they, they do come to Uganda and yet they are not controlled and other factors come in like people are smuggling gold, people who are the rebels and all of that. So th that issue has also been an issue that is affecting the indigenous people, and therefore also affecting our landscape restoration uh, policies. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. I, I think that's a very clear example on the challenges of doing land, landscape uh, restoration. I, I would just like to highlight two points. One is the need for an en enabling environment for effective participation of indigenous peoples. Uh, and that also includes women, uh, and that's, uh, that remains as a challenge because he said there's no gender balance. And, and the second point is the need for a, a, a plan for sustainable livelihoods uh, to, uh, to be part of any uh, restoration uh, in initiatives. So now we move on to our... Um, another, at least now from a month, we, we move to our... Uh, 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 another uh, woman speaker. She's a, she's a, as, as, as I mentioned a while ago, she's a scientist. So, Anne, as a, as a scientist, why do you think indigenous rights matter in sustainable landscape management and restoration? Thanks, Joan. Um, so, when I 
was invited to this panel, I was very excited I was going to get to put on my advocacy hat. And then Joan <laughs> said, no, you need to be a scientist today. So I'm going to talk about the scientific basis for advocacy. Um, first of all, uh, I do research just to give you some background on Red Plus. Uh, we have a work going on currently on multi-stakeholder initiatives and multi-stakeholder forums. And I've worked for many years on land tenure rights and indigenous land tenure rights in particular. Most of, I haven't worked in North America or New Zealand. Most of my work is in uh, Peru, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Indonesia, uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, um, and elsewhere, um, mostly in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and I'm based in Latin America. So first of all, I think one of the most important pieces of data that is, uh, tends to surprise everyone when they hear it, this is from Rights and Resources Initiative, 50% of the world's land outside of Antarctica is in the hands of indigenous people and local communities. That's an incredible amount of land. And I think that when I put that in a, a draft of a book chapter recently and somebody said, where did this come from? <laughs> they didn't <laughs> believe me. So that's a really important piece of data. And the other important piece of that, of, uh, part of that is that only 10% of this is legally recognized. So right there, we've got a yeah. really important issue. Also, recent data from uh, RRI, at least one third of the carbon, if we want to talk about climate change, the carbon um, stored in tropical and subtropical forests is also on the lands of indigenous people and local communities that have not been legally recognized. So that's just an important foundation for everything else I'm going to say. Um, on research we've done around RED and uh, these initiatives coming into communities sort of to so solve climate change or you know these great ideas about what we should uh, be doing to, to restore forests, et cetera. Our, one of the things we found in our research is that the, the relationship to the community depends a lot on the past relationship that community members have had with organizations, projects, individuals, or the state coming into their communities. It's not like a clean slate and that outside experts come in with a brilliant new idea and uh, we win over the communities and, and get to uh, make these things happen on the ground. That's just not the way things happen. What we're really talking about is the, this sort of top-down initiative approach. And this is still preliminary data, but from what we've seen so far, um, it seems that the initiatives that, are really, that really do take hold are the ones, first of all, that have a history and a relationship and build trust with communities. But they also go into communities with, uh, with the humility of a learning approach. And not coming in with answers, but coming in with uh, support, facilitation, and there's uh, research around single loop, double loop, triple loop learning. It's new to me a bit, so I'm not no expert on this, but single loop learning means you adjust your goals, and double loop means you adjust your questions, and triple loop means you adjust the way you think. And I think we all need to be thinking about partnering with indigenous peoples and local communities, coming to these communities with the idea of the triple loop learning, that we're all learning together. Um, so that's also something coming out of, out of our research. And another piece of this is around participation. Um, a lot of the work around uh, RED or climate change has been sort of pushing towards these ideas of jurisdictional approaches or landscape initiatives, multi-stakeholder processes, and all of these are building, potent they ought to be building at least, on a whole history of research and experience on participatory processes that's been going on for years. And sometimes I think we aren't, I said this yesterday, I don't think we're taking actually the lessons from the past to these new places. And there's a real difference between bringing someone to the table and bringing them to the table with the power to actually influence decisions. And uh, so you want, to, you want people at the table, but also the ability for them to be part of making the rules of the, rules of the game. And that means undoing the institutions of inequality. And to undo the institutions of inequality, we have to go back to this question of securing rights, and especially the rights to land, territory, and resources. And just to uh, talk a little bit further about that, um, from our research, sort of rights, I, I work a lot in Latin America where it's land titling, which is the, the way of securing rights. But it's really important to understand that the title or the legal security is not enough. It's often, uh, it's often very important, but it's often not enough. And it's not enough because with every victory, there's always a backlash. There's always uh, somebody who wants access to those resources, access to that land, 
it may be the state, it may be a company, it may be working through bribes or, or whatever, it may be direct challenges, it may be land invasions, but there's always more to be done. And so the only way to really continue to, to defend rights is to not only recognize them legally, but also to build the social movements and the alliances um, and advocate for, uh, for real rights and security for indigenous people. So I, I think that also clearly demonstrate that in order to address the issue of inequality, we need to secure land rights for indigenous uh, peoples to correct that social injustice. So not, mm, the final speaker, but not the least, is, is Luca from Oxfam. As one of the persons most actively engaged in the global land rights campaign now, can you tell us the successes and advances of this global campaign? Uh, yes. Yeah, so first I would like to say that you have heard a lot of stories now, and I think the first message is pretty, is pretty clear from, from this uh, discussion. You know, the hashtag of this conference is Think Landscape, and there's no way you can think landscape or sustainable landscape if you don't first you know, secure the, the land rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. So I think that's... Something I want to stress because it's quite uh, strong already. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk about the joint project Oxfam and many others have with indigenous peoples and uh, local communities and research organization, which is called Land Rise Now, which is a campaign. You can go right now on the, on the website, landrisenow.org. You can sign up and see uh, what it is. Basically, a few years ago, a number of organizations, so the Rights and Resources Initiative, uh, International Land Coalition, Oxfam, Asian Indigenous Peoples Pact, and many others, uh, organized a number of conferences to give momentum and accelerate the recognition of uh, indigenous and community land rights. And a number of initiatives came out of, that, uh, of those conferences. Um, and one of these is Land Rights Now, which is a public campaign. So may, basically, it's a campaign to speak to everybody, to, to speak to your sister, your friends, your neighbors, in the north, in the south. Um, and, and it's basically trying to answer a question. So Anne talked about this huge, this massive tenure crisis. Not 50% of the land of the world owned by, managed by indigenous peoples and local communities and just 10% recognized as owned by them. So how can you address them? And the, the answer was, you know, there's the lack of political will. It's, uh, you know, political will is like, a, it's kind of a black box concept. No, we always use it. Even yesterday, I heard many speakers say, you know, we have to get politicians, we have to change the agendas, but how can you do that? So the way we tried to answer that was, you know, you create political will if you create political pressure, and you, cre you create political pressure if you mobilize, you know, if you have solid science, and we have it, there's solid research, and if you can mobilize, you know, the constituencies, so indigenous peoples and local communities, but also all the others that can support these uh, right holders. So, and these are, you know, active citizens or, you know, the urban middle class students. So those that can help moving a bit of votes, a bit of pressure um, and things like that. And the other important point was to try to put on the table a different narrative. So that's why conferences like this one are really important, huh? because these are places where you can actually shape and contribute to creating a different narrative. You know? And, you know, for us, it was really important to say that indigenous peoples and community land rights where at the center of sustainable development. So what we basically, this translated into, and now there are 800 organizations and communities that have joined this campaign, is a, is a public campaign, is an alliance campaign. Uh, we use, uh, there's a Land Rise Now logo, you can download it, everybody can use it, as long as it contributes to the goals. Um, and we basically do two things. The first one is we support uh, national campaigns by um, indigenous peoples or you know, civil society organizations that for some reason are not able to, or not willing to do, to get capacity on running international campaigns, or it may be, you know, a research institute or a land organization that, you know, don't know how to do campaigns or digital campaigns, or even big organization like Oxfam, we, we cannot campaign every year on land, so it's useful for us to, you know, to follow our cases and our partners across the years. And we have supported so far in two years seven, seven campaigns national campaigns. And then the other things we did is, is uh, weeks of action. Um, 
we did uh, three uh, global weeks of action. The first one was uh, on around the Indigenous Peoples Day. The second one was around the Earth Day in uh, last year. And the last one, a few weeks ago, around the World Food Day. Uh, and it's about we organize like 147 events across uh, the globe, one, some small, some bigger. Um, and the, the purpose was always to support the national campaigns or the local influences strategies of indigenous peoples and local communities. So not just to make noise, but try to connect with decision makers and try to get an impact. So uh, among these campaigns, we have, of course, successes. We are still following up on many of them. It's a long process. You know, some of these struggles are, uh, have gone on for centuries. Uh, the best example, the, the most successful case is a recent one uh, in Liberia, uh, where there was a discussion of very important Land Rights Act. As you may know, Liberia is uh, one of the most affected countries by land grabbing. Uh, it's 20% uh, of the land in Liberia is already sold to foreign investors without counting the national investors and without counting uh, you know, the, look, the small uh, investment, just more than 200 hectares. Um, a lot of conflicts. Uh, and there were you know, a discussion in the parliament about uh, land rights uh, act and the extent to which was supportive or not of community land rights. Um, and as you know, the recent, uh, this year, I um, mean, the president of Liberia elected was quite a, an international person because he was a former football player. So we did an international campaign, uh, which worked very well uh, in Europe, uh, for example, and in West Africa in general, because George Weah is quite famous. And then at the end, uh, supporting the civil society working group on land rights, we managed to have the, the pro-community land rights act. Of course, it's just a step. It's nothing, you know, it's just a law and that you need implementation and everything, but of course it was uh, very successful and we are very happy about that. I just want to say something uh, to close, uh, why Oxfam is doing this. So uh, the campaign is, is steered by an advisory board where there are indigenous people activists or experts uh, and we are very proud of this campaign because um, uh, we basically, Oxfam does two big things now. It's, uh, we fight the, you know, what we consider the two biggest challenges of our time, which, is, which are climate change and inequality. And there are very few topics like indigenous and community land rights which are really at the cornerstone of both. So for us, it's the, you know, like catching um, two things with just one uh, shot. Um, and to do that, you cannot do it uh, by yourself. And, uh, and you do it through alliances. Uh, and we are very proud of Land Rights Now and the fact that, you know, indigenous people's representatives and organization are leading it uh, with us. And we hope it will grow. And uh, we have campaigns uh, planned for 2019, three national campaigns already uh, in, the, in, the, I mean, in the plans. So if you want to join, because this is a campaign for individual supporters, so you actually can sign petitions, you know, do actions. So you have to go to the website, register yourself, and then you receive your actions. Uh, thank, thank you, Luca. Uh, before I open the floor for questions, I just want to ask who among you already is aware of the land rights campaign? Land, land. Okay. So, Luca, Luca, you have a lot to recruit now. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't need to repeat what Luca has mentioned, but just to, to say that I'm, I'm also proud to be part of the campaign. Uh, were, were the ones who started it with as, as, a, uh, as a form of partnership between indigenous organizations and many of the advocate groups. Uh, and this is really uh, resulting into uh, 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 big, the, the interlink, or it, it has strengthened the connection between the local and the global, and the global to the local. So this is one good example of that uh, uh, running campaign that directly supports the struggles of indigenous peoples for land rights recognition. So now I open the floor for questions. I will take three before we, uh, I ask the panelists to respond. Uh, because we don't have much time, I would appreciate if you can be very uh, short in your uh, question and if you can direct your question to any of our panelists. I see here one. The one at the back and here. So you'll be the three. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I want to say thank you very much um, for sharing with us. It's very um, 
inspiring and motivating at the same time. To be short, um, I have two questions. One, especially um, according to Chile, you talked about, uh, you want to, in Spanish or in English? Uh, okay, I, maybe I can translate it. Yeah. Um, uh, sí, um, hablando de desarrollo eh, en Chile, hablando de cómo eh, la dificultad entre la sociedad, las indígenas y el desarrollo capitalista. ¿Qué problemas eh, dentro de la comunidad, eh, qué son los desafíos dentro de la comunidad entre la gente que quiere eso, vivir cada día y que se ve obligada a capaz salir de la comunidad y hacer otro tipo de trabajo que capaz hasta podría ser extractivista o, o por lo menos salir de la comunidad. ¿Qué dificultades hay, digamos, dentro de la comunidad? So I asked um, what the difficulties are within the community when it comes to the, the problem of, you know, development and what is development within that community and how the difficulties within the community itself uh, are in that place. And then the second question is we talk about 50% of uh, indigenous and communities, 50% uh, of the land is owned by them. And I'm very happy to hear all the indigenous talks, but I'm a little bit worried about what are the other communities? What does determine an indigenous person Um, because there are a lot of, for example, Afro-descendant communities in uh, Latin America that don't have the rights of indigenous people. Uh, and I was wondering actually in all of them, how do you deal with that? Do you deal with that? And um, when should that be a, a part of the discussion? Thank you. Okay, the one at the back and then the... Uh, yeah, thank you so much for uh, sharing your experiences. Um, first of all, I'd like to point out uh, something that was said during the, uh, your translation. Um, you said nature, and the translator said natural resources. Resources, mm. sorry. Um, and I just want to highlight that because actually the name of the of the conference is uh, the powers and pitfalls of, of indigenous peoples, of indigenous communities, local communities. And then I think sometimes that difference is um, a pitfall of Western societies, uh, myself included as well. I think all of us as members of uh, Western societies make that, uh, yeah, that distinction that uh, does not entirely reflect on your, uh, on your ways of being and living and relating to, to the land. Um, also, you, my question for, for uh, all of you would be um, how Um, or which are the knowledges or the traditional practices that you think should be actually incorporated in, a, yeah, in, in larger policies affecting you or also in, a, in land right policies? Because um, I feel, and it was said yesterday, that um, indigenous peoples manage a lot of the world's biodiversity. And if this is like that, it is for a reason. It is because you know how, you know how to manage things, you know how to relate to the land and not just manage things, as, as I just said. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Okay, and the one here. Good morning. I just would like to say I'm also an indigenous ascendant and I am my mother too. So I'm very proud to be here today listening to you, seeing all the researchers who are fighting for our rights. Um, my question is to Anne, because I am very concerned about the participation, how we can uh, improve these processes. And I saw you commented about this triple loop learning, so I would like if you can elaborate a bit so we can understand what ca has been understood as a way to move forward and make things really to uh, integrate the knowledges, the worldviews and practice of the indigenous people. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for those three questions. Uh, we only have 15 minutes left, so I will rec uh, ask uh, Christian to respond quickly on the uh, question in, in Chile, and then Anne on the particular question, and then for the others to respond to the general question on 
the traditional knowledge practices to be included in policies. So, uh, yeah. 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 Um, well, in English, um, yeah. I think that uh, relate to your question. Um, we need to think about uh, public gods, yeah, um, private safe gods, yeah, relate to the, the how we can think about uh, planning process in the communities, yes. Communities as, as a, not as an imaginary communities, as uh, Malinowski and uh, meet about, uh, we, we go to the communities, we are communities, in global world, um, we are communities. Maybe uh, we have uh, one, one same um, from that we are too in the colonial world, yes? We, t we need to talk in Spanish, in English, yeah? No recognizing uh, the, the original towns, towns yes? That uh, his, his uh, cosmological uh, lands, uh, yeah, perspective, uh, person, self, I don't know, yeah. Then uh, when, we, when we think in develop, development, uh, we think the, uh, relate to the, the planning, a uh, community planning process, yes. Uh, associate with or invocate uh, the, the seven uh, article of the uh, uh, one seven, uh, Sorry, six sixty. Yes, sixty nine. Ah, yeah, I have, yeah. I have uh, convention, convention. Yes, relate to the the importance of the communities in the incidents incident in the public policy in the programs and the planning uh, in yeah. case of her territories. Yes, we, we we work with the planning process about planning process that uh, need to. Um, and reflection and ethnocentric uh, uh, view. Okay. What, what we uh, understand about so, uh, as the, the, the uh, yes, uh, na nature or uh, yeah. <laughs> natural resource, yes, is uh, different. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe Anne? Okay. Yeah. Um, so as I said, I'm not an expert on these different kinds of loop learning. I've just been uh, kind of learning about it a bit myself. But I think that the, and again, this research is still in process. But um, one of the people working with me on this, I don't think he's in the room right now, but uh, there he is in the back there, <laughs> Juan Pablo, uh, was we've done this big literature review and looking at uh, research and around processes, participatory processes and participatory forums and all of this. And one of the things that um, he was surprised to find and, and worried about actually was that it seemed that top-down processes weren't really the problem. Um, it wasn't just that bottom-up is better, which I think many of us who work on the ground and work with communities like to believe. But that in fact, some of the most effective processes seem to be the ones that were top-down, but they were top-down that were done in a way that really took a lot of time to address the kind of the issue of political will to some extent around all of the different institutions that would be involved in um, sort of moving things forward. So you kind of build political will at higher levels, working your way down, working with government, working with you know, the regional government, the local government, whoever needs to be involved, and building sort of a constituency around the idea. But then you're also taking, you're, you're doing this with humility. You're not doing it as the experts coming in and saying, we've got the answer, get on board. Um, but rather, you know, building ideas, discussing, and kind of looping down to the, to the communities or, or groups of communities or federations or whoever else is specifically involved in the process. Um, and then really taking it on as a partnership from there. You know, this is, these are sort of the common goals we can establish, and then how do we work towards this? But th going with the will to listen and learn, and I think that that's one of the biggest problems in 
any kind of global initiative. It's still built around expediency, blueprints. Mm. We've got the answers. Let's make this work. Let's not get bogged down in all of these <laughs> p political problems, which actually are the, the problems of inequality and the, the roots of, um, of, of the problems themselves that we need to be solving. So I think that's um, where it comes from. And if you look, if you just Google triple loop learning, you'll, you'll find some sort of definitions of what these mean based on different, um, in different uh, sectors of work. So a lot of it comes from business, um, but it's very applicable to, to just thinking about how, how, how much are you willing to change the way you're thinking um, when you go in uh, someplace to, to, do, to do work. And I just want to come back to that other question about um, communities. Uh, okay. <laughs> and I think it's an easy shorthand as a researcher to always say indigenous peoples and local communities. And it's partly needed because if you don't do it that way, you're going to get into a lot of complexity that's way too difficult to manage in a, in a short discussion. Um, obviously, there are differences between indigenous peoples and local communities. But I think there's also a bit of a continuum. There are indigenous peoples who are indigenous but not legally recognized in their countries. So if, you're to, if you want to make sure you're communicating to certain governments, maybe you need to make sure they're being included. Um, there are also tradition, more traditional communities, Afro-descendant communities, um, rubber tapper communities in the Amazon. I mean, there are communities that also have a strong history connection to the land. And then, of course, there are peasant communities um, of all kinds, ones that have lived there for many years and ones that are invading indigenous lands. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, speci specif the specifics start getting complex. And I think in terms of the data, one of the reasons we talk about uh, IPLCs is precisely because it's, it's very hard to get this data at all. Um, as, and I think breaking it down between indigenous people and local communities starts getting really difficult. The data just isn't out there. So a lot of the global data is at at that scale, um, and still obviously needs a lot more work in the future. Thanks. Okay, uh, Sylvia, and uh, do you want to respond on the traditional knowledge? What? Yes. Uh, ah, okay, Nathan, yeah. Okay, thank Thank's you. Uh, the gentleman in glasses asked a very good question about uh, use of traditional knowledge. Indeed, maybe what I can say that uh, most people have not given in, uh, the impetus that the traditional knowledge deserves. Because we cannot talk about restoration without talking about full involvement of traditional knowledge. So my appeal to everybody here is that you must have that one within yourself, within ourselves, that traditional knowledge is very key. And we should go back and commit resources commit time to it to understand it better. Because for me, in my interaction with other people, I have not seen people giving it adequate uh, time, adequate resources that it deserves to come out. And that knowledge is mainly within indigenous peoples. I, I must say this, because the indigenous peoples are the only ones I have seen very proud of, their, of themselves and of their traditional knowledge. Thank you. And I'd just like to carry on from that um, point because that's a key point. Um, those who hold the traditional knowledge, indigenous people, that is their knowledge and that is their intellectual property. And so that also needs to be taken into account, especially when you're thinking about putting it into policy and into planning. Um, and it can be done in ways, um, and has been done in some countries, um, my own included, um, where it is a First of all, um, acknowledging that it exists in your planning processes and writing it into um, your policies that it actually does exist and into legislation if, if you can manage that. Um, I am fortunate that I, um, in New Zealand we do have it written into um, our legislations and um, some of our, um, in, uh, specifically into our Environmental Management Act. Um, but that's very fortunate for us. But in terms of the implementation of it and the way it is included, um, it's not about what traditional knowledge should you put in. It's acknowledging that it's there um, and recognising it and opening, and opening the door for the Indigenous people to participate in the decision-making on how that is included. And that doesn't mean that you write specific things into it. It means it's 
allowing a door for dialogue. And that's really, really crucial because they are the intellectual property right holders of that knowledge and only they can provide it and only they can assess it. And that is key. Well, thank you, I'll just touch on this briefly. Um, I just wanted to provide an example, especially since my sister here and everyone has talked about how important um, it is to acknowledge the rights of that. I just want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, how we put that into practice. So in Minnesota, for example, uh, Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe had found that one of the lakes that they were um, fishing, uh, walleye, from was the, the walleye population was depleting. Um, so through their own processes and natural resource department and using traditional knowledge, um, they decided to, uh, to stop fishing that. Um, and they set a plan for how long they would um, adhere from fishing and to be able to watch and see how the populations replenish themselves. Um, and also for maple syrup being one of our traditional practices, um, there's no way to have that uh, knowledge written down. We learn from the land, we listen to the land, and that's how we know when we are able to begin the, the maple syruping process, when it's time to tap, uh, when, when that process is over. Um, that's, that's specifically about feeling and listening um, to the land and, and the uh, current status of it. So uh, it's really hard to share that with others. So I would just encourage you um, to work with your uh, uh, neighboring indigenous communities and really listen um, to the elders and listen to the people who are living that life every day and what they have to say and really taking that to heart. And just really quickly, I want to talk, uh, just touch on uh, what you said about indigenous people's rights and, and some indigenous peoples not having them. Um, the problem is, is, is just like human rights. Um, these rights are not rights that can be given or taken away. These rights are either upheld or they're violated. So really what's happening around the world is most um, indigenous people's rights are, are just flat out being violated. I just wanted to make that one point, thanks. Loka, final word? We only have one minute, okay? No, I'm, a, okay. I'm the answer so well. Okay, uh, uh, I, I wish we can take more comments or questions from the floor, but unfortunately it's only already, is my time right? Huh? Yeah, so uh, the time is, 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 is up. But uh, we have our booth, the Indigenous Peoples Major Group has a, uh, has a booth up so you can still uh, interact with our colleagues here and also uh, uh, others. And then we'll also have a, a learning session this, this afternoon. But uh, just, just to, to close this uh, session, I, uh, as, as you've heard from, uh, uh, from our speakers, uh, Indigenous Peoples uh, really have a very rich knowledge, but also are facing serious challenges in relation to uh, our stewardship of uh, landscapes. Uh, and j j just to say that, uh, again, to emphasize the point that the remaining biodiversity of the world, 80% of it are in indigenous territories. And forests managed by indigenous peoples are better managed than those managed by state. So this clearly demonstrates that we are uh, uh, the stewards of our uh, en environment and our ecosystems. And we need thereby to protect these stewards, our rights, our security on our lands, territories, and resources so that we can sustain this. We can sustain the way we manage our landscapes in a sustainable um, way. And the other point is also that we need effective partnerships and participation of indigenous peoples. And, and, and this is also a partnership that is open to work with, with different groups, scientists, uh, academics, uh, states, and, 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 and other development uh, actors to, to really work together al along a rights-based approach to landscape uh, management together with tools yeah, cultural indicators and, and tools for monitoring that is participatory. It's, it's been shared clearly that we, we, uh, there's a lot to learn from each other and we can do this by getting together, getting our acts together and, and, and collaborating uh, towards uh, the, the protection of our landscapes 
And, and finally, just a stress that we need to ensure that women are also in the center of all of these initiatives and efforts, because without women, we will not achieve sustainable management of resources. So thank you. And uh, please, uh, let's give a round of applause again to our speakers. Uh, and we, we have our booth uh, upstairs. Please feel free to uh, contact us or approach our speakers. And our learning session is what time? 2.30? Is it? 4. We will have a, a learning session at, at 4. So again, you're, you're welcome. Thank you.